Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, Acts chapter 5, continuing in our study of the book of Acts. We did finish Acts 4 last week, so Acts 5. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it to the apostles' feet. Now before we read further, we need to understand what's going on here. So let's just back up to verse 32 of chapter 4. I need to catch the tail end of, of chapter 4. So verse 32, And the multitude of them that believed were, were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold. So you see what's going on here is people are selling out in the church, the early church here, and they're having all things common. Go back to Acts chapter 2. This is So Acts chapter 2, we're going to be in the 40s, verse 40s. Uh, this is where, so Peter gives his first sermon, you know, Peter's Sermon on the Mount, or not Sermon on the Mount, Peter's um, uh, Sermon at the Day of Pentecost. And Acts 2.38 is famous, Repent and be baptized. And here we are, just three or four. Uh, so verse 41, about three verses later, Then they that gladly received his word, Peter's word, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So Peter's getting on with it, and 3,000 souls are added to the church here. Watch what happens immediately after this, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. By the way, I would suggest to you that is... That doctrine can be found in Matthew chapters 5 through 27, the Apostles' Doctrine, and it is extremely works-based. Uh, and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers, verse 43, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the Apostles. And we talked a lot about healings last week. Watch 44. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. All right, now back to thirty-four, uh, chapter four, excuse me, chapter four. So we left off in verse thirty-four. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And and Joseph, who by uh, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we see what's going on here. I mean, you you can't miss Acts two, Acts four, exactly what's going on. So again. This is about 50 days after the crucifixion of Christ. You know, 50 days later was the day of Pentecost, which is Acts chapter 2, when Peter stands up, gives his sermon, and we saw immediately right there they are having all things common. Here we are in Acts 4, and they're still having all things uh, common. Remember, Peter thinks, but Peter knows that before the return of the Lord, Jesus Christ to earth to set up his thousand year reign, there's going to be a period of seven years of great tribulation as prophesied in Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, throughout the Old Testament. Okay, so he thinks this is coming. Right here he thinks this is starting right now. So they're having all things common so they can make it through the trip. Because during the trip the gospel is he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. They had to endure to the end. Workspace. Question? No, just looked like maybe you did. Okay, so now into Acts 5. So Acts 4.37 again. Having land, sold it, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But, okay, when the chapter starts out with but, okay, you know, it's the old, when your kid says to you, yeah, but, you know, you know that they're ready to argue with you, right? Or do take the opposite side of what you just said, or what was just said here. So everybody's selling out, having all things common, but, okay, apparently they're not going to have all things common here. 
But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Okay, so they did go out and sell their possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So you see what's happening. They've been told, go sell, have all things common. You know, just in case this doesn't work, let's keep a little bit of money in the back pocket just in case we need it, and we'll give the rest to the apostles. And I'm making a deal about that, and we'll talk about it more as we go on here. Now, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Okay, now one of the reasons I'm making a deal about this is depending on who you talk to, again, a lot of people try to match what they read in the Bible to the doctrine they already believe as opposed to matching their beliefs to the doctrine that's being taught in the Bible. Amen. Okay, if you make that differentiation, you've got to let the words say what they say. And so there's so many people that want to make this, well, the reason they're going to get, and as we know, they're going to get struck dead here, uh, was because they lied. Or it's because you know they weren't really told to sell out. I mean, you can't believe. So we're going through the book of Acts in a Tuesday morning class that I attend, not teach. And I was like, great, this is, you know, we're going through the book of Acts. Under, you know, I was making a big deal at the beginning. Understanding the transition that occurs in the book of Acts is the key to understanding your Bible. It's the key to understanding the doctrine for the church, which is the body of Christ. And why... Paul's writings and Paul's writings only. Romans to Philemon. 13 out of 27 books in the New Testament penned by Paul. For you math majors, that's almost half of the New Testament penned by Paul, and yet people just totally ignore him today. And very few recognize the differences. They all want to make it the same. No, it's huge different. For that matter, Almost every doctrine that Paul teaches is exact opposite of what Peter and the Lord Jesus Christ taught while he was on earth as far as what one needs to do to gain salvation. Paul is the only one that makes it makes it that you know he's saying what the word, what God the Father told him to say, but Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for instance, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul's the only one that tells you you can obtain salvation without works. Peter, it's all about works. That's why they're selling out, having all things common. They have to endure to the end. Uh, The Gospel of the Kingdom in the book of Matthew. Hold your hand here in Acts 5. Let's actually go back there and, and take a look. We're going going to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. So you see, we're at the end of the book of Matthew. And this is going to be the gospel of the kingdom right here. So when you want to see the gospel, so this should be red letters if you have a red letter edition. So Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The end of... Whoa, the end? Yeah, the end of the world, because at the end of the trip is the battle of Armageddon. I mean all hell on earth breaks loose. But verse 14 said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. Well, what's the gospel of the kingdom? Back up and read verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. There's your gospel of the kingdom. They've got to endure to the end. It is totally works-based. It is totally contrary to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, to Galatians 2, 16, to Romans 3, 28. Therefore we conclude how that by faith the man is justified and not by the deeds of the law. Okay? Paul tells us over and over and over again. So anyway, now back to Acts 5. So people want to try to make Paul say the same things as Peter and and Matthew through Revelation being the same doctrine, and it's not. 
And so they've got to do something with this story. What do we do with Ananias and Sapphira? And for that matter, what do we do with selling out and have all things common? And some people, well, that's why our church, some people say, in, in this study on, on Tuesday mornings, you know, that's why we're so big on taking collections for you know the homeless people out here. Okay, great thing to do, but no, it's not, that's not what this is saying. You know, they try to make this as justification for sure. why they should do that. No, you know, Paul definitely says we should um, have a charitable heart. You know, we should look after those who can't provide for themselves. Okay, that's one thing. That's how you want to um, walk. Yeah, yeah, your walk and, and give with some of the money that you can. Hey, great, have that. That's up to you. But don't use Acts 2, 3, and 4. And what the church is doing there to justify or to say that's what you're doing today. And you can't miss it. They had to sell out and watch. Uh, so, so again, let's go back to verse chapter 5, verse 1. And we're going to read right through the first uh, several verses and then come back. So 5.1, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that, that heard these things. And the young man arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. He was dead. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter had answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then she fell straightway, then she fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Whoa. Do we really see what just happened there? They sold it like they were supposed to. They lied about how much they sold it for and kept back part of the price in their back pocket, brought the rest of the apostles' feet, and they're struck dead just by the words of Peter speaking. You see the power that Peter had. You know, how did he know it, first of all? You know, the Holy Ghost showed it to him. Just him speaking the words, and Ananias falls dead, she fall, his wife falls dead afterwards. That serious power. But people want to just go ahead. I'm sorry, I was, I was just thinking about Adam and Eve. When God said, In the day that you do eat of that, you're going to surely die. Yeah. You'll surely die. Whoa, they were under grace, weren't they? They, were they sure grace. were, bless you. They, they definitely were sitting in grace. They sure were. were. Compared to Ananias and Sapphira. Absolutely. Compared to Ananias and Sapphira, for sure. But people say, well, no, you know, this is just here. You know, we shouldn't um, we shouldn't lie. No, they were struck dead. Um, and they were, you know, and, and some people still, they, they wouldn't let this be doctrine that they were commanded to sell out. And, and it's like, how do you miss that? It's in Acts 2. It's in Acts 4. It's in Acts 5. And... And they said, well, no, they got struck dead because they lied, not because they didn't sell out. Well, it's the combination of the two. What was it that made Ananias and Sapphira, and I'm not really looking for an answer, I'm posing this as a question to you, though, to consider. I mean, why would they think they had to keep back part of it if they weren't commanded to go sell it all out? You know, why? what made them think they had to lie about it so they could keep certain parts? If they didn't really have to, they say they didn't really have to go sell out. Well, then why'd they do it at all and lie about it? I mean, it just it makes no sense. You can't come up with a rationalization and try to rationalize that away like people are trying to do today. 
A question or comment? No, I was just going to say faith and belief. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't have enough, right? They didn't have enough faith and belief for the camera there. But like you said, they, they had enough to sell sell it to begin with. They went that far. Yeah. They sold their own home. They went and sold it. Exactly. I mean, they went that far, but what stopped them from just holding it? Holding. Yeah. If, and if they didn't have to go out, why didn't they just hold it? Exactly. Because Remember, the building. reason they're selling out is they think this trip is starting right now. Maybe they weren't sure. They, well, yeah, they didn't have exactly. enough belief in it. Exactly. That's that's the point. They didn't. Their faith wasn't strong enough, if you will. Did they die because of the actual Holy Ghost dwelling within them? You would okay. Have they would have been baptized. So. Right? So. Verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Therefore, he had to have the Holy Ghost to lie to the Holy Ghost. Now, keep your hand here and come back to Matthew chapter 12. Remember, I made the statement to you earlier that the Apostles' doctrine that they're continuing in is Matthew 5 to 27. We're going to Matthew 12. For you math scholars, that is between Matthew 5 and Matthew 27. And in this, just watch what we see here about blasphemy. You know, you hear some churches today will talk about the unpardonable sin. Okay, well today we're under grace. All sin is forgiven. But in the past there was an unpardonable sin and we're about to read it. Verse 31 of chapter 12 of Matthew. Wherefore I say unto you, and this shall be in red letters, if you have a red letter edition, this is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But, contrary to that, the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And let's keep reading and watch. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost. It shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Neither in this world, this period of great tribulation, nor in the world to come, that thousand year reign, the kingdom on earth. The gospel of the kingdom. Okay, And then the kingdom will come in the future. Everybody says we're building a kingdom today. No, there is no kingdom today to build. There's only a body of Christ to build. Paul tells us over and over, it's the church which is the body of Christ. Okay? In Matthew, when we read back there in chapter 24, and this gospel of the kingdom, and if we would have kept reading forward, he talks about the kingdom of heaven. That's the thousand year reign out here. The heavenly city, New Jerusalem, is the kingdom of heaven. There's this... We're not talking about those today. Anyway, that all exists during the thousand year reign. Okay? All right, so blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. They could not be forgiven in this world, nor in the world to come. Ananias and Sapphira, did they blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Could they be saved in this world or no? Or could they be saved in this world? No. Could they be saved in the world to come? No. Because of what we read in Matthew. Yeah, they could not be saved. Right here where it says uh, in verse 4, Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? That goes to show how deceitful the heart is, and that's where it stemmed out of Desperately wicked. Okay, so no, they could not be saved in this world, nor in the world to come. Therefore, when they blaspheme, boom, they're dead on the spot. Wow. That's pretty strong. Now we're going to talk in the second hour about blasphemy and the dispensation of grace. Think about this guy named Paul. Did he blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Absolutely. Acts, Acts chapter 7, the stoning of Stephen. Who's the ringleader? Saul. Who later becomes Paul. Saul. And he's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And this doctrine says right here they can be they cannot be saved, neither in this world nor in the world to come. There's no second chance. Matches the doctrine of 
matches the doctrine of Hebrews. Where when that man loses his salvation, there is no second chance. It's impossible to renew him again. Okay? So, back to Acts 5, our study. And we've made it all the way through. Verse 11 now. Okay, so it's, it's just important that we see. They're having all things common. Let's just stop and regroup. They think the seven years is coming. Acts 2, 3, 4. Now we're into 5. Every time, they're having all things common. That's what Peter instructs them to do. It's what the twelve instruct them to do. They're doing it. Because that's how they're going to get through the trip. And in the future, by the way, that's exactly what they're going to have to try to have to do. If they take the mark of the beast, they're done. If they want to eat, if they want to buy food through the marketplace during the seven year trip in the future, they're going to have to take the mark of the beast. You cannot do trade with the general world out there unless you take the mark of the beast. And at some point, each person's going to be faced with that. Don't worry, we won't be there, so we don't have to worry about it. Alright? And and that's the good news. Again, the dispensation of grace. Praise Amen. God. We live in 2013 and in the dispensation of the grace of God. This you know, this seven year period will exist in the future, and it begins when this dispensation ends with the what's called the rapture of the church, the calling out of the body of Christ in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. A glorious event. That's what we look forward to. When the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall meet them in the clouds, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen, Amen. to that. That is, that's how this dispensation will end, and that one will then begin. And now it's hell on earth. And now, if they blaspheme the Holy Ghost, take the mark of the beast, they can be forgiven neither in this world nor in the world to come. So that doctrine will come back. But it's not in place in the year 2013 in Romans to Philemon, the doctrine for today, for the church which is the body of Christ. Questions on that before I move forward? Yeah. So, I've heard in various places, about a third of the population being destroyed during that period of time. Is that what's was that is that what's causing it? No. No, that's that's the whole battle. That's the battle of Armageddon. Would that be geographically? Uh, so there'd be more people than just a third. Geographically Israel? Or uh, the Holy Land? Or are you talking about the world? The world. The world. In the world, yeah. So, but again, we don't have to worry about that. We're out of here. Yeah. And if you're still here, it doesn't matter. You won't have a second chance then. If you are sitting in this room today and you're not, you don't have a testimony of salvation. And you hear the gospel preached today, how that Christ died for your sins, was buried, took your sins to hell, and was raised again for your justification. And all you need to do is trust in that and that alone for your salvation. Well, if you're not saved yet, just call in the name of the Lord to save you based on you believing that and trusting in that and that alone for your salvation. You don't have to do it here. You can do it tonight in the privacy of your, your bedroom. You can do it on the way home. You can do it while you're sitting there right now between you and the Lord. You know, while I'm still over here, Mumbling other words and reading other words. If your heart allows, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anytime, anywhere. Amen is right, Clayton. Amen is right. And and again, the grace that we have in this dispensation does it get any better than that? All right. But the good news is, it, it, I say good news. The, you know, the better news would be if you did, if you were not saved yet, that you. Right now, you between you and the Lord, you called on the name of the Lord for Him to save you. But if you don't today, and you're still lost, you get a second chance tomorrow. And you get a, a third chance next week, and next month, and next year, assuming this hasn't happened yet, or you know, assuming you're still alive and on the earth, and this hasn't happened yet. You get second and third and fourth chance. Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood up and preached... In Acts 2.38, he said, repent and be baptized. Again, not for today. 
It was the doctrine for then. But if you did not accept that, if you did not receive that what He was offering right then, you were therefore blaspheming the Holy Ghost, guess what? So while Acts chapter 2, verse 41, Acts 2, 41 told us there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You know, Josephus says there was probably 100,000 people there when Peter preached that. That means 97,000 people blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Wow. <coughs> Let's talk about those 97. Could they be saved in that world? No. In the world to come? No. They just got condemned to hell, if you will. They just had one chance to believe? Because, they're blasph- because they blaspheme the Holy Ghost by not believing. That's blasphemy. So again, not true for today. You get a second and a third and as many chances as it takes. Praise the Lord, because... I was probably on uh, chance 100 and gazillion 35, you know. I'd, I'd heard the gospel many times. I wonder if the percentage now is like that. That's a great, you know, so 3%. And actually, you said between 100,000 and 200,000. That'd be 1.5 to 3% of the people believe. I would say we'd be lucky if it was that high. Yeah. Really? Jerry? Oh, yeah, yeah. I really would. I, I don't know, and I have no no numbers. <laughs> I was just to curious. I mean, you know, I'm I just saying. wondered because way back when, I think yeah. people were more religious. Way back when, now, as opposed to now. Well, they were Jewish, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, let's let's get on with our study of Acts five. Just the key of having all things common. Again, not doctrine for today, but that was absolutely what they were commanded to do back then. There was a reason for it. Uh, the tongues and miracles that go with the whole thing. I mean, you can't miss it. Everything Peter was doing in early Acts, book of Acts, has nothing to do with what today. Tongues, healings. Matter of fact, we're going to see real quickly here about healings in, in the next few verses that we come to. And selling out and having all things common. That was the doctrine that Peter and the Twelve were teaching here. And it matches the doctrine that the Lord Jesus Christ taught in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom. What was the gospel of the kingdom? He that shall endure to the end. To the end of what? The end of the tribulation. Okay. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all, parentheses, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch and of the durst no mo- uh, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them. But the people magnified them, the twelve. And believers were the more added to the Lord, not to the church, they were added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women, end of parentheses. Stop, go back, verse 12. Let's start there again, and now we're going to skip the parentheses. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, verse 15, insomuch that they brought forth the sick unto the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing forth sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Did these people, did these twelve men, called the twelve apostles, have serious power? Amen. Absolutely. So much so that just the shadow of Peter <clears throat> passing over them healed them and healed them, verse 16, every one. Now, as we studied last week, you know, the purpose of healings, because as Peter told these people, they were going to become a kingdom of priests. Priests could not have a blemish to go into the temple. They were not allowed in the temple. How are they going to do the work of the priesthood? if they can't go in the temple. Therefore, and Leviticus chapter 21, we read last week, it told us, verse 16, if you weren't here and you want to look it up, um, stop the recording, look it up. Leviticus 21, 16. But it shows that men cannot be lame or broken-handed, broken-footed, and on and on to, to go in to be a priest. Therefore, that's the purpose of healings. The other is it's a sign to Israel. Okay, tongues, healings. There's signs. Okay. Questions on that? 
And, and once again in verse 16, they were healed every one, not just a select few, as the counterfeit <coughs> religions that we see today on television with these counterfeit healers and try to convince people that they're doing it in the name of God. Well, they're doing it in the name of a God, but it's not the God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the God that got kicked out that's trying to make himself like the Most High, Satan. That's the God that those people are basically serving and worshiping right now. They're not calling it um, witchcraft. They're not calling it um, devil worship. They're trying to do it in the name of God Almighty, but it's not of God Almighty because it's counterfeit to what His Word says. Amen. Okay, verse 17 now. Then the high priest rose rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, with envy, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in, in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to all the people. Uh, to the people, remember the people is always the Jews in the book of Acts, to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. And when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them where, whereunto this would grow. You know, when they went to the prison, they, you know, the doors are still shut. The keepers of the prison are still there. How'd they get out? Well, the angel of the Lord was involved. Um, Somehow they got out without anybody knowing it and without that door, or with that door being shut again anyway. Um, take it for what it says. I'm not going to assume anything or presume anything past that, but somehow they got out without any of the keepers of the guard knowing it. Verse 25, Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And they were commanded earlier not to, right? Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, notice it's the high priest again, asking them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? This name is what? Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, exactly. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. A lot right there in that verse. So, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. So, are Peter and the twelve preaching the same doctrine that the Jews have learned and followed from Genesis through Malachi? No, it's different. Okay, it is the doctrine in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Peter's teaching it right here. It's called the Apostles' Doctrine, as we read at the beginning. The Doctrine of Jesus. Or the, or the Doctrine of Jesus. But that's right. The, the term that we read earlier was Apostles' Doctrine, which is, and it's also the, the Doctrine of the Gospel of the Kingdom. Okay? And then the second part there, and intend, the last part of verse 28, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Once again, the Jewish leaders, the high priests, He's very concerned about the blood of that man, the Lord Jesus Christ, being upon his shoulders. He's, you know, and who wouldn't worry about that? Verse 29 of chapter 5, And Peter and other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And that's not a bad verse right there for us to follow today. Okay? That would be a trans-dispensational doctrine. Starting with Adam and Eve, all the way through the end of Revelation, we ought to obey God rather than men. If there's one thing that God Almighty expects of each one of us, it's obedience. And of course, today that would be obedience to His Word. 
Okay. Um, anyway, okay. The God of our so verse thirty. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Whom ye and who's he talking to? So who's the ye in that? The high priest and the high council, if you will, the senate of Israel. You slew him and hanged him on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And again, when does Israel get their forgiveness of sins? Second coming. Okay. Out there at the second coming. Exactly. Okay. That's when they get the forgiveness. They have to endure to the end to get the forgiveness at the end. Uh, Verse 32, And we are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey Him. There's that obey again. Now verse 33, When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Then stood up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. In the second hour, we're going to go look at this guy in detail, or a little more detail. But just remember this right now. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had a reputation among all the people. Okay, This guy is the doctor of the law. If you will, he's professor of Yale Law School, the... You know, I mean, he's he's the he's the man. All right, he's got a great reputation with the, the people. Again, the people being Jews. Is, is this the same guy that Paul said he studied? Them? That's why we're going to talk about it in the second hour. Absolutely. And so, yes, it is okay. the man that Paul studied under, a doctor of the law, had a reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel. Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do is touching these men, the twelve. For before these days rose up Thutis, something like that, Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to night. Okay, so here's one false Apostle, if you will. A guy named Thutis. 400 people followed him. He ends up being slain. The rest of them just scatter about that they obeyed him. This is the way it worded. What does God expect of us? Obedience. And then that religion went away. Verse 37. After this man rode up, rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished. And all, even as many as obeyed Him, were dispersed. Interesting, obeyed again. So this guy, Judas of Galilee, he started a religion. A bunch of people followed Him. He dies off. That religion scatters abroad. Another one that it goes away on its own. It's not of God. Alright? Who's talking? Gamaliel? Gamaliel, the doctor of the law, is the one who is speaking here. Great question, because whenever you're studying your Bible... You've got to get the context. Who's speaking? To whom are they speaking? What comes before? What comes after? Okay, to understand, and that's where why we have 320 some denominations today. Too many times they take things out of context. You can't grab a verse in the middle and build something around it. What's the whole meaning? And who's saying it? To whom are they speaking? And I would suggest to you, I told you that the Apostles' Doctrine was Matthew what? 5 to 27, chapters of Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew 27, I would suggest to you that 90% of that time, it's the Lord Jesus Christ talking to 12 men and 12 men only. So how can we go back there and try to say He's talking to us? Amen. He's not. You're taking it out of context if you try to take it to you. Okay. So, so there's another religion that came and went, just like I shared with you a couple weeks ago. Kim and I just pray big time with our nephew getting wrapped up in one of these. It's just like this. Somebody starts some new religion, and it's as cultish as can be. And and that guy even died 20 years ago, but they convinced all their followers that that, that, that guy had, you know, he was the Holy Ghost. 
the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. Well, He died. And I said, okay, great. Okay, and He died. Yeah, but His Spirit went into His wife, and now she's the mother goddess. Are you kidding? <laughs> you, know, you know, we laugh like that, and and people are cried up, are caught up into it. And I, I, I would laugh too. I mean, it, it wasn't so, so tearful to me that it's yeah. my nephew that's wrapped up in this and caught up in it, and it's it's destroying their family. It's come between their family, just tearing them apart. Anyway, back to our study here. So the point that Manly is making here is, if it's not of God, you know, guys, be careful. If you think you're going to go stone these twelve or, you know, harm them, you know, because if it is of God, let's let's go where He is now. Verse 38. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Lest happily you be found even to fight against God. And to him they agree. Who wouldn't? You know? So leave them alone. If it's not of God, it's going to go, it'll run its course. It'll go away. But if it's of God, you sure don't want to be fooling with them because you're fighting God. You're blaspheming God. You're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Yeah, absolutely. So that, so they agree. Uh, verse 40, and to him they agree. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them. They commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Okay? So, that's a we, we made it through a whole chapter today. Chapter 5. Right on time. How about that? Amazing when you start getting the camera going, Brian, and things will get recorded. But uh, so watch the transitions going here. Okay, watch who's speaking, to whom are they speaking? Because again, why do we write? You know, the, one of the principles that we follow, Second Timothy two fifteen, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. The word of truth. Oh, you grace people, you divide up the Bible. Yeah, we sure do, because that's what he told us to do in 2 Timothy 2.15. Because, and here's where I'm going with all this, because we've got to find what scriptures are to us today in the year 2013. The scriptures that are to us today for our salvation are Romans to Philemon, those books written by the Apostle Paul. And in there, Paul tells us in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, in Ephesians, and you know the doctrine he teaches is that man, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he hung on the cross. You know, Peter keeps going back saying he's he's um, Lord and Savior. He's the Son of the Living God. Yes, that's it. Paul tells us a little bit more. He says, "Oh yeah, when he died, he shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sins. He took those sins to hell, where we deserve to go. And on the third day, God the Father raised him for our justification." And any of you people in 2013, if you'll put your trust, if you'll believe that, and then put your trust in that and that alone, and stop trying to work for your salvation, just trust in that work for your salvation, and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name, the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And again, you can do that anytime, anywhere, and you only need to do that once. Because he tells us in Ephesians 1.13, when we do that, we're saved and we're sealed unto the day of redemption. There's nothing we can do to gain our salvation. There's nothing we can do to lose our salvation. The reason we're studying the book of Acts to see the transition from this doctrine and to the doctrine of Paul is so that we follow the right gospel for our salvation. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. Endure, he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. It's the gospel of Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. He died for our sins, was buried and raised again for our justification. Okay, thanks. End of uh, chapter 5. We'll take a good 10 minute break, about uh, 